raise your hand if you're familiar with Murphy's Law. Okay, some of you. For those of you who aren't familiar, Murphy's Law says that anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and usually at the worst possible time. Now, do you feel a bit familiar with it, maybe? Let me give you an example from my own life. So, in my program, we have a one-year master's program followed immediately by a four-year PhD. It's a bit of an intense transfer process, as you could imagine. And in the middle of this transfer, you can see me here in the middle of this, um, we are trying to do a bunch of things. We're trying to submit our master's thesis, we're starting our PhD courses, we're trying to submit grant funding even though we have no idea what we're doing yet. And in the middle of this chaotic period, I fell down a set of concrete stairs and hit my head on an iron railing, landing myself in the hospital. I should probably mention at this point, this was my fourth traumatic brain injury. I got my first playing soccer at 16 when I was kicked in the face. So you could probably safely call me a little bit accident prone. So I got this fourth traumatic brain injury and it really was a tough decision. Should I go on a leave of absence, give my brain time to heal, or should I tough it out and see if I could get through this period without taking time off? I ended up trying to tough it out. I really didn't want to prolong this period where I needed to submit my thesis. But someone should have reminded me that one hallmark symptom of traumatic brain injury is poor decision making. So by November, it was clear to everyone around me I was not coping. I had a variety of symptoms, things like sudden and frequent migraines, which on the TTC, I'll tell you, is not fun. Things like nausea and brain fog. I couldn't remember conversations or pay attention in classes. I had vision and jaw issues that we couldn't really figure out. And then I also had this lack of balance and my mental health was getting worse. So suffice to say, I finally recognized that I needed to take a leave of absence. So I worked with my doctor, my psychologist, my family and friends. We submitted all the paperwork I needed to take a one semester leave of absence. And my department was amazing. This was a pretty bureaucratic process, but they helped me with all the forms I needed to do this. Or so I thought. There were significant difficulties ahead that I hadn't accounted for. Let me give you just a picture of what this was like. Financial stress. So there were a few things that really affected me I didn't account for. One was that I was in a funded program, but if you're not in the program, you don't have funding. On top of that, my job had been a student position, so if you're not a student, you're not allowed to work. I also couldn't work outside of that because I was supposed to be on a brain rest break. I had enough in savings for maybe a month or two of rent, but as with most of us university students, we don't have a ton built up in savings. And then as a final cherry on top, I got a letter in the mail saying I was on academic probation from our student loan agency for the rest of my studies because I hadn't formally told them I was going on a leave. And then, as a cherry on that cherry, of course, because our funding is front-loaded in September, they were asking me to pay back a portion of those funds. So that was things that weren't working well. And then medical expenses. I've put some on the slide behind me. I needed $8,000 in jaw treatments, $6,000 in vision therapy, and that was on top of regular things, like physiotherapy, massage, my psychologist appointments. So I'm sitting in my room. I'm on a brain rest break. I can't use my phone. I can't do anything to distract me. I have mounting costs and not enough money to pay for them. Suffice to say, I had a bit of a breakdown with my support network, and then we slowly started to problem solve. Any expensive medical treatments, no matter how much I needed them, were not gonna happen right away, so they came off the table. I slowly worked to repeal the academic probation, which, let me tell you, academia loves forms. It was a lot of work to get that off, but we did. And then in the end, I was incredibly lucky my parents were able to give me the rest of the rent money for that semester. I don't know what would have happened otherwise. But 
the good part of this story, I did end up going back to school. I'm happy to report that I'm in the last six months of my PhD, so four years later, I've been able to complete it successfully. Um, it did take a bit of work. I'm now permanent acquired brain injury. I needed a $2,000 psychoeducational assessment. I have accommodations, but it's been a joy to be back at school. What I'd like to highlight is this, though. This was a difficult experience. Dealing with chronic pain isn't really a treat. But the most stressful part was the financial. And no one had warned me about it. I had no idea going into it that this might even be a problem. And even today, I still think about this all the time. There's a fun picture of me back there wearing some assessment prism glasses. I've actually moved home with my parents for two years to be able to afford the $6,000 vision therapy. Um, and it's totally worth it, but also very expensive. So I started thinking, if this was so hard for me, a student in post-secondary with great support systems, what is this like for students who are younger than me? Elementary school students, secondary students who are dealing with disability in our school systems. At the time, I was already studying special education and French immersion. I'm a teacher in those subjects and that's where my heart lies. But I really thought I want to start focusing on the cost of disability in French immersion programs. And I'm going to tell you some of the stories I heard that really broke my heart. But first, how many of you are familiar with French immersion? Just to give me a sense. Okay, most people, fabulous. In case you aren't, just to give you a quick overview, it's meant for non-French speaking students in Canada. Um, so they learn English and French simultaneously, French very intensively in the beginning, and then 50-50 as they get older. Um, as you can imagine, this is a fairly competitive program because there's a lot of benefits. Things like cognitive benefits, learning a language early, it's good for brain development, and social development, being able to go to Quebec and travel and interact with French culture, as well as sometimes better access to jobs because you're bilingual. However, because this program is so popular, it's really been plagued by claims of elitism recently, that people aren't getting equal access to this program. And it turns out they are pretty right. Let me show you some of the statistics. This is from a 2018 report in Toronto. And I just want to give you a quick overview of what we see in French immersion. 49% of students in French immersion are white. That's compared to only 30% in the rest of the school board. 63% speak English as a first language, compared to only 45% in the rest of the school board. 90% have no special education needs at all, compared to 78% in the rest of the board. And 74% have university educated parents, which usually means they're in a high income area, compared to only 50% in the rest of the board. So we can see, overall, there is a bias towards white, English-speaking, typically developing students with university-educated parents. So because of this, we started looking into what might be causing the reason for some of this bias. Let me tell you about one of the families in our study. Emily is a mother, it's a pseudonym, but she's given me permission to share her story. She's a middle-class family, that's what she considers herself, she is in a low income area in school, which means they need lots of resources, uh, they might need extra funding from the government. Her middle daughter, Hannah, significantly struggled in French immersion. For the first few years, they really did a wait and see model, see if she can catch up. But by grade three, it was clear she was not going to catch up without help. So they did a psychoeducate, or they said they wanted a psychoeducational test and they talked to the school board about it but they were told there was at least a three-year wait for an assessment within the school board. So they were debating, do we pay for the assessment? Do we try to do it through the school board? And then Murphy's Law kicked in, as it is. The COVID-19 pandemic happened, moving everything to online learning, and any hope they had of a timely assessment went out the window. So, feeling like they'd run out of systemic support, Emily paid for the assessment herself. Let me tell you what she said in her own words. She said, I'll never forget it, having that school support team meeting. 
I'm in front of this psychologist and all these different people, and I literally lost control. The head of special education, she said, it's okay. And I said, I'm not crying because my daughter has a learning disability. I've come to terms with that. I said, I'm crying because I had to pay $3,500 to get your audience. I said, that's why I'm crying. How many kids are falling through the cracks? That was very disconcerting for me. I was heartbroken. Even after paying $3,500 for an assessment, Emily found out the hard way there wasn't sufficient French special education support, and she ended up taking Hannah out of the program anyways. But her question is one that really stuck with me. How many kids are falling through the cracks? The truth is, we don't really know. We do know from school board statistics that by grade nine, 70% of students have left French immersion programs. There hasn't been a thorough study yet on why that happened, but I think maybe we're starting to see some of the reasons here. Let me give you a few more reasons this might be happening. Just this year, the Ontario Human Rights Commission published a Right to Read report. They examined whether students with special education needs were getting timely assessment and interventions, and they found that most school boards were not doing this. Even though the research tells us clearly it needs to happen, it's not currently happening. This was also shown in our study. One parent was told she couldn't request an individualized education plan, which for non-teachers is just kind of the gateway into special education, until grade three, which we know from research is way too late. On top of that, even when they get um, an individualized education plan, there is only support in English, even though in Toronto, all of their schooling is in French until grade three. So they're getting intensive reading support in a language they're not speaking in the classroom, which you can imagine might be kind of difficult. As a final point, we really heard from parents that they were investing time, money, and effort just to keep their kids in the program. Not even thriving in all cases, but doing well enough that they could stay in the program. This ends up being an emotional and a financial burden on the families. As you can imagine, they have a lot of difficult conversations, and usually it ends up breaking the kids' hearts when they're moved out of French immersion. So it is a tough subject. So now that we know this, what can we do about it? I'd really like to highlight, and I saw this in my study, that individual resilience and community support is amazing. These families are really coping with a lot, but it's not enough against systemic barriers. We need more accessible assessments for these students so that they can get help earlier. And trust me, we're on a few teams right now that are working on it, so hopefully that will happen in the future. But even beyond that, and the reason I'm talking to you today, is we need systemic change. We need there to be less barriers for students to access these assessments, especially if they're in low-income communities. And this is where all of you come in. Systems don't change overnight. We know this. But awareness raising is the first step. And what we really need are radiant allies who can help us spread the message. It can be a simple thing, like sharing an article you read on Facebook or mentioning it to a neighbor, but it is a good thing to talk about, and I know the families will appreciate it. So, with my talk coming to an end, I'd like to ask you, how many of you have heard of Ypres Law? A lot less. So Ypres Law is Murphy spelt backwards. It means that everything that can go right will go right, and usually, at the best time. So let me leave you with this. This inequity caused by disability and the high cost of disability in school systems can and will be rectified. And there is no time like the present. So on behalf of all of the families that I hold dear to my heart and myself, I'm asking you to remember what you heard today. I consider it my duty to speak on behalf of those who don't have the same platform I do. And I hope that you will do the same.
Thank you.